Apostle Paul was adamant to defend the truth of the gospel, the unadjusted gospel of Jesus Christ, not only as sufficient to save sinners, but also as sufficient for the church to mature into the image of Christ. You know, it's been a few weeks, but in 2.12 through to uh, 3.6, Paul revealed that as those who have been called to be and to spread the aroma of Christ to the world, that commitment to and endurance in this task will require constant empowerment from above. Paul is writing to preserve the worth and sufficiency of the gospel, especially when it becomes difficult to do so because it's so often doubted, questioned, and sometimes even completely rejected in the church. That's where he's writing. Paul had invested nearly two years of his life at this point in the Corinthian church, and now some had turned on him and they hammered Paul for everything, even his appearance and the way that he talked. It will be impossible to remain fundamentally and unwaveringly committed to the gospel, not only in the world, but also in the church, which is again where Paul battled, unless we properly understand the glory and sufficiency and priority of the gospel. Paul openly and sincerely preached the unadjusted gospel of Jesus Christ because only in its ministry is the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ beheld. It didn't need to be tampered with because those who reject the gospel did so because they were blind to it, not because it was insufficient to achieve God's purpose. So we unashamedly, sincerely, and exclusively proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ so that all people may behold the glory of God in it and become like his son. So let me pray and we'll look over this passage. Father, once more, I ask for your presence more than anything. I ask, Lord, that you would fill me with your spirit for the sake of preaching this sermon tonight to these people that have gathered here, your people. Father, be with us, be with me, Lord. Overcome me as I speak, my mind and my mouth. Overcome our ears that we might hear and understand and believe. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we pick up the passage in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians verse 7. He writes, Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? In verse 6, Paul had called the Old Covenant the ministry of law the letter that kills. That's what he called it. He is writing to prove the surpassing glory of the ministry of the Spirit, the new covenant, which is not of the letter, but of the Spirit. The ministry that saved these believers had not been written on letters of stone for them to obey and thereby become God's own children. Rather, it had been written on their hearts by God's Spirit that they are, in fact, His children. The ministry of death of the law did have some glory in it, to the degree that it reflected the glory of God, but that glory was temporary. And that which is temporary, we're learning here, is insufficient to save, and it's insufficient to conform us to the image of God in His Son, which is what God's will is for His children. Verse 9, For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. So Paul is revealing here that there are two kinds of ministries to do, to minister. There's condemnation and there's righteousness. All the ministry of the law did was condemn those who were under it. So he's trying to make a distinction between these two kinds of ministries, implying that the issue in Corinth is that some, his opponents trying to destroy his ministry and his character, are continuing to conduct the ministry of condemnation by using the law. Paul was probably being criticized because his ministry was usually rejected. It didn't yield immediate or visible results right away. So the problem with Paul is not just his character and his abilities, but with the content of what he speaks. The false teachers in Corinth understood that to get results, you have to adjust the gospel. You have to turn to the law to produce more results that are more visible and appear more quickly. And they're saying, Paul's ministry doesn't do this. It doesn't produce results. It doesn't produce enough change. So Paul decides to teach them where true glory lies 
in ministry. Verse 10, indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. So he's very clear. There's no glory whatsoever now in the ministry of condemnation, the law, that which came to Israel through Moses as he came down off the mountain. Paul is saying, listen, now that the glory of the new covenant has appeared and surpassed what glory there was in the old covenant, we should now reckon the old covenant in our hearts as having no glory at all, none. And what has no glory, he's saying, has no sufficiency and no power. So to minister to people with the law as a means of maturing them is to minister a ministry of death that has no glory, is insufficient to make people righteous, and will eventually kill them. The glory of God revealed in Jesus Christ in the new covenant is so glorious and so sufficient, it renders all past revelations of God's glory as now empty. It, it isn't just another step. It's the step. Everything else stops. All the focus goes to the gospel. Verse 11, four, if what was being brought to an end, notice his point of reference for that is when it came, right? When it came, when Moses was coming down off of Sinai, for if what was being brought to an end, when it came off the mountain, came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. When the law was given, it was given with an ending point to it. It came to be brought to an end, and yet it still came with glory. Only now it has no glory because the ministry which proclaims that which is permanent, that which had no end point to it, has come. Verse 12, since we have such a hope, since we have such a hope, the hope that comes with a never-ending covenant of righteousness filled with glory, we, the ministers of such a covenant, remember, are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Three times in this text, verses 7, 11, and 13, Paul mentions that the glory of God in the Old Covenant was, or the glory of the Old Covenant was being brought to an end. All throughout the time it was in force, it was given to end, not to continue. The ministry of the law to designate God's people had its day, it had its glory, it's over. It's over. Beloved, the ministry of death, the Old Covenant, reflected God's glory on the face of Moses. But the ministry of life and of righteousness, the new covenant possesses God's glory in full in the person of Jesus Christ who lives forever. Another covenant will never be needed to save or to secure or to transform God's people. So the only thing you use the law for is to kill those who think they'll be made righteous by it. That's it. That's what it does. So ministers of the new covenant in the church are not like Moses. That's not the kind of ministers they are. And his face reflected so much glory that those to whom he ministered couldn't look at it. And that was a glory that was coming to an end. So beloved, we were meant as God's people to gaze at his glory, but only the kind of glory that was permanent, right? Verse 14, but their minds, the Israelites, were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, which again, the law, ministry of death, the letter that kills, old covenant, they're all used interchangeably in this text. Verse 14, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil, a veil to prevent people from beholding the glory of God, remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. So the Israelites under the old covenant didn't have the means of revelation provided to them to really see the glory of God, which then was being reflected on the face of Moses, but has now been revealed to reside in the person of Christ, whom we see, whom we behold in the gospel. Only the glory of Jesus allows us to actually behold the glory of God. The glory of the new covenant or of the old covenant is insufficient to bring us near to him and allow us to see his glory. It cannot accomplish this. Verse 15, yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. So the glory of God in Christ can only be seen with the heart. So the veil now for those who reject Jesus in the gospel, who 
want to bring in the ministry of the law. That veil is now a hindrance in their hearts, keeping them from seeing his glory, which is now revealed in the new covenant ministry of the spirit. Verse 16. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. So he's talking about something that happens in the heart. To be seeking acceptance and justification through the law is to have our back turned to God. Turn to him. The veil that keeps us from seeing his glory is only removed when we behold Jesus with our hearts. That is through faith in the gospel. Verse 17. Now the Lord is the spirit. Remember verse 6. The Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Not where the law is, is there freedom. But where the spirit is, there is freedom. Freedom from the law and therefore freedom from death and freedom from condemnation. So Paul is teaching us law and freedom cannot, do not coexist side by side, beloved. You and I are not conformed to the image of Christ by a mixture of law and gospel. Those are two different kinds of ministries to entirely different levels of glory. In fact, one of them now having no glory at all, and apparently it is glory that transforms God's people. This is very important for us. If we seek to use the law to do anything but kill us when we think we're righteous, we're going to misuse the law. We'll misuse it. Paul likens turning from the law to the Lord by means of the Spirit. He likens that to moving from death and slavery to life and freedom. Right? There, there's, those are the two sides. Those are the two sides. Verse 18, and we all, those in the new covenant, the church with unveiled face, removed by Christ, beholding the glory of the Lord, which resides fully, by the way, in the face of Jesus, which he will reveal in just a few verses, are being transformed. Did you hear that? It is happening. You and I tend to measure our transformation or our progress by what we can see all the while not understanding that God is saying it's happening. It doesn't matter if you can measure it, if you can gauge it, if you can see it, it doesn't matter. That's why we have verse four, if you remember that in Paul's confidence about the message he preached, the transformation of people into the image of Christ is happening through the proclamation of the gospel because Paul is putting up the glory of Jesus for them to behold with the gospel. So verse 18 again, and we all with unveiled face, all of us, notice that, all of us, there are no exceptions. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, he's built that argument for each of those phrases, are being transformed into the same image, the image of Christ, from one degree of glory to another. The glory of the Lord we see by beholding the face of Jesus Christ in the new covenant, in the gospel, actually transforms us. It actually transforms us. The law does not do that. That's his point. The law does not do that. It does not transform you from one degree of glory to another. There's no glory in it to produce glory. Until, so it's doing this from one degree of glory to another, until we are fully made into the image of that glory we're beholding, that is being made like Christ, which is why John says this transformation will finally and fully happen when we see him. For when we see him, we will be like him. First John 3, 2. So we keep looking at Jesus and never look away. That's church. You look to the law to be made Christ-like and you have your back turned to God. There's a veil over your face. But to look to Christ in the gospel is precisely what will make us like him. The law didn't do that. The law had nothing in it that when you beheld it, it changed you, right? When you hear that there's no power in the command not to commit adultery to keep you from committing adultery, right? The, the, the power, the glory that transforms us into the image of what we're beholding is only the glory of Christ, so if we want transformation, we have to stop looking to ourselves. We have to stop looking to the law. We must look to Christ. We must look to Christ together, corporately, as the people of God. 
We are not sanctified and conformed into the image of Christ by the law or by a mixture of law and gospel. We are conformed into the image of Christ by beholding God's permanent glory in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the only place it resides. And you would say, but don't we still behold the glory of the Lord in the law also? Not anymore, right? Not anymore. It has come to have no glory at all. Paul is telling the church that the ministry of the new covenant, the proclamation of the gospel. So sometimes as you hear preach, you think, when are we going to move beyond the gospel stuff and get to the real? There's, this is the pinnacle. The gospel is the pinnacle. Where, where else are we going to go? It is sufficient to save us. It is sufficient to transform us. Why? Because the glory of the Lord is beheld in it. There's no glory at all in anything else. The glory is in the gospel because in the gospel, the face of Jesus is revealed. The gospel, the ministry of the new covenant is sufficient to do everything God means to accomplish in us. Right? We, when a church is not conformed into the image of Christ, when we're not conforming actively into the image of Christ, when all this time has passed, as a people and we're still dealing with our own sinfulness and own pride and all these things, what's going on? Is there not enough law? Is, is, because that's what we think we have to do to course correct, right? The only way you would use the law to course correct is if you could make people understand you're not going to obey this. If, if, if you live by this, you'll die by it, right? That's what scripture teaches. The law is a different kind of covenant. Those who do them, shall live by them. Those who don't will die by them. So the only way the new covenant people, the new covenant minister needs to use the law is when people need knocked down a notch, not when they need challenged, right? It, it, is, it is to see the glory of God in the gospel. This is the means he uses to transform us. And Paul is saying, look, there's one ministry that does that, that lets us behold the glory of God. And there's a ministry that doesn't do this ministry not this ministry, right? You think, Tony, that you can just hold up Jesus to behold in all this saving beauty and glory and people will bear fruit for God and glorify him with their lives? I believe that with all my heart or I wouldn't be a minister. It, it, it just doesn't happen on our time schedule and by our expectations, right? That, that's not the way this transformation happens. Verse 18, and we all with unveiled face, the, each of these phrases has been created by Paul's argument. And we all, the new covenant people of God, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this, this transformation comes from the Lord, not from adherence to the law. For this comes from the Lord, the Lord who is the Spirit. In verses 6, 17, and 18, the Lord is the Spirit. And the new covenant ministry that gives life and doesn't kill is the ministry of this Spirit. The Lord is at work through the Spirit in the ministry of the new covenant to now accomplish the righteousness in verse 9 that the ministry of condemnation never could back in verse 6. 4-1, therefore. So here we go. Here's why he said these things. Therefore, having this ministry the new covenant ministry of the spirit, of righteousness, of life, not of the letter that kills, not the ministry of condemnation. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, not by our merit, all by his mercy, we do not lose heart. Paul is making this argument to show why he and his companions endure in a ministry that makes them not only repulsive to the world, but to so many in the church as well as to keep the Corinthian believers from losing heart as their same ministry causes them suffering, gets them rejected by most, and often seems to be unsuccessful. And he's writing to every church that has existed under the banner of Christ ever since. The point is their encouragement by telling them of the glory of the gospel they preach as God sees it even though it's rejected and maligned, even by people that claim his name. Verse two, but we have renounced 
disgraceful, underhanded ways. Right? That's the opposite of true ministry. Disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. All going back to 217 and those who would peddle the word and lessen its truth for those it will offend. Coaxing the desires of people by telling them that they can gain God's merit and become like Jesus by the law, by their fundamentalism, by acting a certain way and doing all these things. That's disgraceful and underhanded. That's tampering with the word. That, that's, that's taking a text like this morning and trying to make it doable for you by changing its meaning. That's tampering with the word of God. There's no need to tell people the law in order to get them to become like Christ. That's not the way it works. If it would have worked, there's no need for a new covenant, right? So this is what Paul is saying here. This is for the sake of the ministry of the church in all times. Paul does not use the word of God to manipulate people. That's what he's saying. The ministry of condemnation relies on manipulation. It is amazing what you can get people to do by the ministry of condemnation and how deeply it will affect them for years beyond them having heard it. Right? If, if you've been raised under any type of fundamentalism, you probably still feel nervous when big grace is preached. Your first response to grace, rather than saying, oh, thank you, God, is saying, I, I don't, it can't, it's, it's not that good. Right? No, 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 no. It can't, it, like, you can't even mention grace without making sure you qualify it with, I'm, I'm not, we're not qualifying grace here. No. Right? When people talk about qualifying grace, like, I wonder how holy do you think you are? Right? I mean, do you really, you don't need grace? And, and listen, listen, Paul knows, I know people respond more when you preach law. Of course they do. We love it. We want to be challenged. We want to believe we have some skin in the game. So of course people will respond more readily to the law, to the ministry of condemnation. They want it to be in their hands, the power to not be condemned, right? So of course people respond to it. It's not God's way of transformation. It's not his way. It's not his way. Paul will not use the word of God to manipulate people. Right? That's what he's saying. Because these disgraceful, underhanded ways he's talking about here are not like, you know, in, in this context, not like trying to, you know, seduce women or get money or something. This is about foregoing the ministry of righteousness and life and using the ministry of condemnation. Paul would say, you're manipulating people. That's disgraceful. It's underhanded to make people think their righteousness rests in them. Right? You're using people to do that. You're puffing yourselves up. Right? You, you, we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. That's an amazing sentence. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. The Apostle Paul had a relentless commitment to biblical fidelity. By the open statement of the truth, unashamed, pure, 100 proof gospel, all the time. Christ crucified, all the time. By the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Paul knew that even when the word was hated, it was still doing its job. When it was hated, it still commended itself as true deep down inside to a person's conscience. Deep down, the word will do its work. So if it's veiled, if it's being adjusted or rejected or people can't see it, something other than the insufficiency of the message or the minister is to blame. Right? Do you understand what he's saying here? Right? You think that this doesn't produce results because of how poor of a minister I am and the insufficiency of my message. No, 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 no. It doesn't produce results as readily as we want to see them because people are blind to it, because they reject it, not because it's not a good message to produce change. Look, look, look at verse three. And even if our gospel is veiled, 
as it is to those who refuse to turn to the Lord, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Beloved, it is the perishing that don't see the worth and glory of the gospel. For in their case, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So we see with our minds, Paul tells us, you see with your mind, not your eyes. Salvation is to be able to see the glory of God in Christ. So this is what Paul is talking about when he speaks of the ministry of the Spirit in the New Covenant. It's the gospel in verse 4. That's, you see, he uses words interchangeably for things. Right? The, the ministry of the New Covenant is the gospel of the glory of Christ. That's what the gospel is, a gospel of the glory of Jesus. His glory is seen in God's mercy through his son, which was not readily apparent under the old covenant that Moses brought off the mountain. The old covenant was brought in, again, 430 years after the covenant with Abraham to prove to people they weren't going to obtain it through their obedience, right? That was the purpose of the law. So it's not that the glory isn't there in our message. It's not like it's not glorious enough to do a work. It's that people literally can't see it. Their minds are darkened, right? Their minds are darkened. You can't go to the doctor for that. In 317, the ministry of the new covenant ratified by Jesus has as its goal our transformation into the very image of God, which we now know as Jesus Christ himself. Through the new covenant ministry of life by the Spirit, God is forming us into the perfect image of his Son. The law doesn't have the ability to do this. It's only, it only condemned us. Why? Because we couldn't be made righteous by it. It just proved how unrighteous we really are. Only the gospel can accomplish this transformation because in the open statement of its truth, verse 2, it reveals the permanent glory of God in Jesus Christ, which can and does transform us and make us righteous. Verse 5, 4, right? So going back to 4 so that we get a context for the word 4 in verse 5. In their case, those who are perishing, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, for what we proclaim is not ourselves. Verse 2, again. But Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake, ministers of the new covenant are the servants of the people of God for Jesus' sake. If they proclaim themselves, as those back in 2.17 were doing, their message would not be veiled. It wouldn't be hard to see at all. It'd be clear as crystal what they were saying. It's veiled. Paul's message is veiled because it genuinely proclaims Christ. That's why it's rejected, because it's the truth. It takes everything from us, puts everything on Christ, and we simply respond to it by grace through faith. That's it. We are naturally blind to Jesus Christ in the gospel. They, Paul is saying, ministers of the new covenant proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord because that's what that covenant proclaims. Their ministry is a ministry of service to them for Jesus' sake, not for them for profit's sake. Right? That's disgraceful and underhanded. You, you, you can, man, you can make money running people's lives. Right? If, if you put them under a thumb of fear, you, you can get away with anything. I mean, you, I mean beloved, the, the, the rampant abuse of, of, of people in particularly fundamental churches is unbelievable. Right? That there's, it's, it's just amazing what the control you can hold over people with the law, with any law. Why do they proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord with themselves as your servants for Jesus' sake? Verse 6, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, Genesis 1, 3, let there be light, 
has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The gospel is received in a person by the miracle performing, world creating word of Almighty God. Paul is letting them know why they must not rely on themselves in ministry. There is nothing but sin and condemnation, darkness and void in the human heart. That's it. That's why Paul takes us back to the nothingness that was before creation. He's doing that to show the church the true state of the human heart. That's why he goes to Genesis 1 all the way here in 2 Corinthians 4. We are so void inside that Satan is successful in blinding us to beauty. We are so corrupted inside that we blind ourselves by turning from Christ to be justified by the law. But now we find that the word of God, the gospel, the ministry of the new covenant, the open statement of the truth, it does something, which is why you should stick to it and trust it. It does something. It creates life where life could not create itself. The hearts and minds of unbelievers are dead in trespasses and sins and blinded by Satan. So God does something when he saves a person that he does completely by the proclamation of the gospel. All right, not by the proclamation of anything else. He does something. He shines in our hearts through the gospel of the glory of Christ to remove the veil in order to give the light of the gospel. God says, let there be light in people. And when he does that, they turn to the Lord, the veil is removed. So there's something supernatural that makes turning to the Lord happen in the first place. It is this light creating word of God in his son, Jesus Christ. For salvation to happen in a person the very same thing that happened in Genesis 1-3 has to happen in their heart, literally. Right? That's what Paul is revealing here. So if, if you think about that for a moment, do you see how dependent we're meant to be on the power of the gospel as the church? If God doesn't show up and do what he did in Genesis 1, nothing we do or say will produce the results he intends. So when we gather, we are begging God to show up and raise the dead, begging him to give life. We don't come into this place trusting our music, our abilities, our talents, our ministries to do anything. We need God to create faith or it's not going to happen. So don't ever fudge on the message of the truth is Paul's point here. There's only one way a person gets saved that God uses the gospel by the power of his Holy Spirit to create life where there is only darkness and void. That's what we're praying for God to do in Moundsville, in our church, in the Ohio Valley. We can't create worlds or faith out of nothing, but God can, God can. So we preach the word by which he does that, the gospel of the new covenant. So the glory of God, the knowledge of it is seen in the face of Jesus Christ who is revealed in the gospel, not in the face of Moses through whom came the law. And we behold him now with an unveiled face, according to 3.18. This is precisely what had happened to Paul on the Damascus road. Remember that? It's how he was converted. Light, literally. Paul was not seeking salvation. He was not almost there. He he just said that when he read the old covenant, a veil light over his heart, he wanted nothing to do with Jesus, was stamping out the people that wanted to follow Jesus. Do, do, Do you see, this is not just pure objective truth. Paul is speaking from experience here. He's like, listen, do you want to know how I got saved? I was on my way to arrest and kill more of you. And a light burst out of heaven, and I have never been the same, right? It's, it's, beloved, that's what happens. 
That's what happens when a person gets saved. You're walking this way, God shows up, and you walk his way. That's it. He creates faith. A blinding light from heaven literally changed Paul's heart from antichrist to pro-Christ to the point where he'd lose his head for it, literally. And now with unveiled faces, beloved, nothing preventing us from seeing God's glory and being transformed by it, we are being made perfectly into the image of Jesus Christ himself. It is happening. It is happening. This is happening. We don't have to make this happen. We have to stay committed to the message that does make it happen. And it will take time. Beloved, it just takes time. It is happening wherever Christ is being proclaimed. God says that's the case. We don't have to worry about our results. Our focus is the content of our message. We don't have to get worked up about ours or anyone else's slow progress. We just need to be irrevocably committed to proclaiming the word that reveals Christ. That's it. That's it. Jesus Christ has saved us and secured us under such a perfect covenant, so that's what we could do. There's nothing to worry about. Not only is my gospel going to save you, my gospel is going to transform you, so just proclaim that message. Just do that. Right? That's why I left the church on the earth. Now, finally, by the way, God's will for making man in his image at creation will be realized. He's just always been about accomplishing his original intent for creation. Now it will be realized through a new and better Adam through whom comes a new and better covenant. This and this alone we proclaim. Beloved, this ministry is our ministry. Its glory surpasses the old covenant. It gives us hope. It makes us bold. It unveils our faces that we may fully behold the permanent glory of the Lord. It sets us free from the law that kills us. And it makes us righteous. It transforms us from one degree of glory to another as we progressively behold him more clearly by the Jesus illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. So we do not lose heart. We don't lose heart in the new covenant ministry to which we've been called. When Paul talks about losing heart, the phrase is, we don't sinfully defect. Right? We don't lose heart. Our confidence comes from the glory and sufficiency of our message, not from our results or success. Don't get discouraged when you can't see. There are things to behold that our eyes can't pick up on. Beloved, it's, it's, the victories here are small, right? They're, they're, they're not usually, and notice the flow of the New Testament just on a, on a literary level. The, the, the days of 3,000 and 5,000, they're done by the time Acts is over. They're done. They're not even talked. Never again are numbers mentioned. Do you hear about this massive, you know, Couple, and the revivals that have taken place in, in, in our, you know, in, in history, I'm not remotely going to discount them. I'm not, that's not my intention at all. I'm saying that, that we, you can't really use those to gauge, uh, like when we talk about wanting revival, what exactly do we mean? You know, the first great awakening was a very good thing. The second great awakening, not so much, right? We're still paying the price for the second great awakening in the American church. Just, just notice the flow of the New Testament. It's, it's, it's not popular. It's not grand, right? It's, it's, it's not. These churches had John and Paul and Peter and James, and they're gone. They're gone. They, you, you, they, they don't exist anymore. Well, didn't, didn't they build a legacy? Yeah. And then they died. And look, Ephesus lost its first love like 30 years out. You know, we, we don't know what became of the churches in Revelation. We, we don't know. I can tell you this, they're not there anymore, right? Somewhere along the line, they forgot. They, they, you see, what you want to be is portable, really. You know, I, I, I know that I talk about this a lot, but it's just weighing heavily on my mind as, as 
the course of our country is changing. This is meant to be portable. This is meant to work anywhere. Anywhere, right? If, if the government shuts us down, there will still be a church, right? I mean, it, it's, I mean, we'll figure something out. Why? Because we don't need anything but our message to be who God has called us to be. You don't need anything but the message to do the work that God intends to do in people's hearts. That can be done anywhere, anywhere. Our confidence comes from the glory and sufficiency of our message, not from our results or our success. In fact, Paul would say, we flatly renounce any and all tampering with the contents of the message. We renounce using cunning means to convince people it's true. We trust it fully as it stands. Because if the open statement of the truth in the gospel we proclaim is being rejected, it's because Satan is blinding people, not because we're insufficient or our message is insufficient. Beloved, for unbelieving people, the gospel is just veiled. It, it's just veiled. They can't see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And here's what we need to remember. All our ingenuity, all our talent, the volume of my voice, the cleverness of my argument, the weight of my threats, these things will not create saving faith. No amount of coaxing or effort or pressure is going to change that. Again, why don't I prolong invitations? Because I can't do the work. The gospel, I try to preach the gospel as clearly as I can. And when I stand down there, I'm trusting that God is either creating life or he isn't today. Right? And besides, I don't know what happens when people leave here. Right? We don't equate salvation with walking down the aisle. You don't have to do that to be saved. You could hear the word, go home and sit on it for five years, and one day it gets in you, and in that moment, God brings you to life. It's just, we just trust it to do this. We just trust it. We will experience unfruitfulness. We will experience a lack of results sometimes. For big spells sometimes, this has nothing to do with us or our quality as ministers or the foolishness of the message we preach. We cannot give in to the temptation to switch from gospel to law in order to produce results. That is what he means by losing heart. Because what the law will produce is death. It kills. The spirit at work in the gospel, which bears witness to Christ, gives life. The spirit creates faith. He gives the light by the open and unadjusted statement of the truth of the gospel. This is what we must proclaim because the word of Jesus is what heals the blind, right? We don't proclaim ourselves. We aren't looking for earthly commendation or to our own abilities as the means of convincing people it's true. Ministers of the new covenant proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord because the same God who said, let there be light at the beginning of creation did this same light creating work shining into our hearts with the gospel, giving us the light of the knowledge of his glory in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul wants us to understand here. The face of Jesus is revealed in the gospel. The place where glory may be beheld, the place that saves and transforms, it's all in the gospel. The glory of God can only be known through the Jesus we proclaim as ministers of a new covenant, as God creates life, faith, in the hearts of people to whom we proclaim him. The law will not do that. It will kill the opposite of what God's word and the gospel will do. Life and freedom for a human being is to behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, which is sufficient to transform us into his image. This is what we're called to proclaim here. This is what we must be about. Beloved, all other agendas die under this banner. The calling of the church as the aroma of Christ in the world to those who are alive and to those who are perishing and the purpose for which we exist and gather is to behold and proclaim with unveiled face the glory of the Lord that saves and transforms us. This is done in the proclamation of the gospel of God, which gives the light of that glory in the face 
of his son. Unbelievers are saved by this word. Believers mature and are transformed by beholding the glory of the Lord together in this word. So we need each other over the long haul. Church is a unified, relentless, comprehensive effort of people over time bringing the gospel to bear on one another's lives. There's no one on the planet as powerful as the people of God. For we are the aroma of God, of Christ to God in this world. Just the church. Do you, that's what we are in the Ohio Valley. The aroma of Christ. And again, I go back to what I said a few weeks ago. Is that what we smell like? Is that what we smell like? We aren't called to make sure our community does anything but know Christ. We unashamedly, sincerely, and exclusively proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ so that all people may behold the glory of God in it and become like his son. If I was going to write a constitution, that's what I would say. So stay tuned. Okay, we're moving.